Uh, Jack comes from my father. That was his nickname because he was born in Jack County, Texas, which is west of Fort Worth. The Fincher is my mother's maiden name. But some people call me Corky. Somebody named it. Somebody latched it on to me sometime, and, and I finally wore it out when I got big enough. Uh, my grandfather come out to uh, Ocketree County a horseback in uh, 1901 and traded six head of mules for a section of land. In two wagons, they come to Ocketree County. My dad at that time was five or six years old, and he drove one wagon, and Grandma was in another wagon, and with Grandpa and a whole bunch of kids. My dad was really, he was a, uh, really a cowboy at heart. He had, a, he had a farm out there and everything, but he loved to rope, and he had goats that he practiced roping on. And I remember it was a pretty good sized kid before I could get out of the house because them goats would knock you down, they'd butt you. It was a little safer to be in the house than outside. We had no electricity. I, in fact, I never lived in a house with electricity until I went in the Army. We didn't have getting natural gas, of course. We burnt wood and coal. We had running water. All I had to do is get the empty bucket and run down to the well and get a bucket of water and run back to the house. That's running water. <laughs> I was doing the run. The Depression, there was no money. Money was almost non-existent. And uh, the Dust Bowl, yes, I can remember quite a bit about the Dust Bowl. Uh, there's, uh, there was one notorious cloud that come through on a Sunday in 1935, and I, it's April, but I don't know the date. Our farm there, it had a draw that run through it, and it blew so hard in the middle of the day that it blew the chickens off of the, off of the flat prairie up where we live, and they were all over on the slope side of this, and most of them were covered up with dirt. And we got home about 10 o'clock or so, and they had me out there, and they had the car light shining, and I was out there pulling them chickens out, and if they were alive, while well, we kept them. If they didn't, we throw them out there in the pile. And I can remember that pretty well, That's that storm. I had two sisters. Uh, Waldine was my oldest one, and Burl was uh, my second, second sister. They were approximately four and five years older than I am. My mother was a, a very compassionate woman. She uh, she just had a high school education. She was the valedictorian of her senior class at Tuya in 1918. Wow. That was the year that the WW1 in, ended. And uh, I, I remember even as early as, say, 19. 35, 37, which I was at 35, I was 10, 12 years old. I can remember certain of it. One of the first things I can remember was when Joe Lewis won the world championship in boxing. I can remember that pretty well. No, we didn't have TV and radio. I was always building what I could build with what I had, which wasn't very much to build anything with. Remember him getting a nickel from him so I could buy a handful of shingle nails. Of course, I probably ruined the porch, but <laughs> it had a jillion little nails nailed in it. My grandfather was really one of my favorite people. He was dumb like a fox. <clears throat> he had a second grade education, and you knew, you would never know he had. Let me tell you how how tight he was how conservative he was. He bought me a Coca-Cola when I come home from church. Right uptown. It's a drugstore. Now that's a big deal to him. He had the ability when everybody else was going this way, he was going that way. 
and, and, and that's the way he made money. She was a little old lady, dip snuff. <laughs> you know the little round snuff pan? She'd take a wooden match and she'd dampen that and he'd stick it in there. I drove a tractor when I was a kid in high school. I drove a tractor from daylight, not sun up, daylight, not sundown, dark 30, for a dollar and a quarter a day and was tickled to get it. I, I, uh, I graduated from high school one night and at five o'clock the next morning, I was on a bus leaving Perryton. When I, when I first come back from service, I didn't have a skill. I, see, I was 19 when I got out of service. I was only in 21 months and nine days. I don't remember the hours, but, but I knew what I was going to do. And, and I got discharged out at Amarillo, at the Amarillo Army Air Base. And I was going out to my sisters who lived out on the west part of Amarillo. And on the way out to her house, after I had my discharge in my hand, I stopped at a hardware store and bought me a two-foot level. I knew what I was going to do. I just didn't know how I was going to do it or what the road was that I was going to take. And, but from there, that's where I started with zero. So I went to the bank. And I walked in and introduced myself to a vice president. And he said, uh, what can I do for you? And I said, I want to borrow $1,000. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you want to put up for a collateral? And I said, $1,000. Well, he says, that's a little different. And I said, yeah. I bought a lot. And I built a house that was 18 by 24. Had three rooms in the lab. The rooms weren't very big, but that's the house that I had. And that's the only house that I ever built and sold and doubled my money on. I built that house in three weeks, working evenings and weekends. I built it myself. So it did. It worked out real good to build a house. Then I built two houses. And then I built four. And that's how I got started in the house building business. I really think that every young man owes a year to serve in the military. And if, if they did, I think we would have a lot more discipline in our people. I did really do. I think it'd be good. I remember I had to register when you come 18. And uh, I wanted to, I then figured out that I didn't want to walk. So I uh, volunteered for the Air Force. Yeah, I wanted to be a pilot. And, and I think I could have made them a pilot. But at that time, they, they had more people had the same thought that I did. So uh, they made us the next best thing they needed, and that was uh, gunners. I, I first flew at uh, Indian Springs at Las Vegas. And that at that point, you'd go up in a plane and you'd shoot out of the waist. I probably was the head of the class. I, I think that's reading the book in the tail. When they, when they fly into a formation of these planes, there's a, on, on the plane that I was on, we had at least a dozen guns on it, two in front, Ones here, you know, had lots of guns sticking out. That's the reason they call them the Flying Fortress. One of the first things I 
particularly after we got overseas and we got in combat, wasn't it? You know those Germans put real bullets in their guns? Them suckers are shooting at you, trying to get you. And that's a, that was my very first observation, was that you're liable to get it if you ain't careful. Many a time, we've come back with over a hundred holes in that airplane. And I had my communication shot out in the tail one time. I was sitting back there and I couldn't, couldn't talk to anybody else because the flak had cut the wire in two. We were flying over uh, Berlin, but we didn't find our group for some reason. And then we fell in with another group. Our group flew over Germany and didn't get a scratch. We flew over Germany with that plane, and the plane that was flying on our left got shot down. I saw it go down and I never seen the chute come out. So I know that nine guys went to their grave that day right there. We had one really, this is, uh, there was less than, there was more than 2,032 bombers and then there was B-24s, 26s, and 25, as well as nearly 1,000 fighters that went up on Christmas Eve of 1944 in support of Patton. We ran out of gas one time, which was, there was quite a few. My friend that I got to be friends with there in Amarillo, his, he was in a different group than I was, and they went to the same target we did, and they run out of gas, and they crash landed in Belgium. We crash landed in Belgium. So uh, we were 80 miles south of Brussels, right on the French-Belgian border. Uh, we caught a ride in a B-17 back to our base. They, they flew us right back to our base, and we got out. And, the guys walked into the barracks and the other crew was sitting there and said, where you been? <laughs> I told them the boat coming home when, when the Germans quit. And then I was at Big Springs whenever Japan quit. I'm proud that I served. And I've always pretty well enjoyed it every day because you know you only get them one day at a time i guess that's probably my philosophy on, on what it is just do the best you can today and i you know i'm not afraid to die i'm afraid not to die we do have a god and there is a big hand in this did you ever think about salt I never understood that too much until I took chemistry. Did you take salt and divide it into the two parts it is, and you take that part and you, you, you use that, or you take this part and use that, it'll kill you. But you put it together and it's something we have to have to survive. If there's somewhere there's a maker out there that's got the master plan. I I love being a granddad. That's that's quite an accomplishment, and not everybody gets to reach that point in their life. And now I'm getting to see the the next generation. I I'd like to be defined by a person that whatever. Whatever job I did, that I did it well and honestly. If I could meet somebody first and have a conversation with somebody, would be my grandfather. I love that old man to death, and I'd love him. I'd, I'd tell you what, if, he, if we only had a 30-minute visit, the first 20 minutes, I'd like for him just to whoop on me to 
make say, well, you didn't pay attention or whatever it was. And then, then we just sat down for ten minutes and have a conversation. But uh, I, and of course, I love my mother. I, uh, I dearly love my mother. Well, I had bought a little portable typewriter, one of those kind you fold up and carry with you way back there. This was in mid-50s. And uh, Debbie wanted to play with that typewriter. And I said, no, you can't play with it. But you can uh, take the typing book and lay down on the floor. You sit down on the floor and put the typer, typewriter in between your legs. And I said, you follow what the book says. And guess what? In about three days, she's typing better than I ever typed, which was not too good. But I, she beat me at the, after her third day. Where, and she learned to completely type out of that book when she was a kid. I mean, either the first or second grade, I can't remember. But she taught herself to type. So your mother's a pretty remarkable girl. I, I can't think of anybody better to be with to finish out your life than Betty. We both agree that if, if, if we hadn't got married, fell in love and got married, probably neither one of us would be alive if we were still single. I'm just so glad to see her every morning when she comes out of the bedroom and Staggers into the there and gets her a cup of coffee and a sweet roll and starts eating and I'm tickled to death to see her. So I uh, I just think you need that part of your life. It's been a good ride. Been a good ride. I can tell you, I love food pretty well anyway, but it ain't chicken salad. <laughs> Get that on record. <laughs> so is that a wrap? Yes, yeah, it is.